Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Introducing RapidMiner Auto Model. I'm Haley Matisa with RapidMiner, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I'm joined today by RapidMiner founder, Dr. Ingo Miersla. Ingo will get started in just a few minutes, but first, a few quick housekeeping items for those on the line. Today's webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive the link to the on-demand version via email within one to two business days. You're free to share that link with colleagues who are not able to attend today's live session. Second, if you have any trouble with audio or video today, your best bet is to try logging out and logging back in, which should resolve the issue in most cases. Finally, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Please feel free to ask questions at any time via the questions panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll leave time at the end to get to everyone's questions. So now we'll go ahead and pass it over to Inga. Thank you, Haley. Um, yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> I am... Um, Got a little bit of a cold um, that might be a little less energetic and, and passionate than I'm usually am, but this topic is so exciting that I um, will do my best to still present in a good way to you guys. So, Rapid Miner Auto Model, that's um, a complete new way for us how to build machine learning models. And I would like to introduce um, some of the basic ideas behind it, and more importantly, we will spend a lot of time going through like four or five different use cases and well, see it in action and actually play around a little bit with this and we will discuss some of those results it, it produces and so you get a good feel. So then the last use case I would like to discuss with you is really about how to use it in a, in a realistic scenario where you might need to do some ETL first and build some machine learning models and then put this into production a little bit um, no, at the end. So that's the whole idea for the webinar. So we go through a couple of those use cases. You will see a lot of demonstration today, only a few slides, but let's kick it off with like two or three slides to, to give you the basic idea what it is. So Rapid Miner Auto Model it is built to really accelerate everything we do as data scientists uh, whenever we build machine learning models. Of course, sometimes we do just, quote unquote, just um, some data preparation, and sometimes a data scientists still prepare some data for, let's say, a BI-style report, some pie chart somewhere. Sure, that's fine as well as part of our work. Here, the whole focus, obviously, is on the machine learning itself. And as you can see, we, we followed, I would say, kind of like a well-understood um, progress here. So, of course, since we want to learn something from our data, we start with the data set. Um, then we need to define a, a task. We, you will see this in the automobile in a couple of minutes, um, how that looks like. So a task could be something like classification or regression. So you want to predict a column, you want to cluster your data or segment it, uh, find some outliers, things like that. Then, depending on the data and the task, um, typically you need to do some data preparation. And this data preparation really is focused on getting the data into the right shape for building better uh, uh, machine learning models. Um, and after we did that um, and, and defined our targets and, and, and we know about our data a little bit, uh, RapidMiner will actually use a little bit of smartness to make you some suggestions, gives you some guidance how you can further improve the data set uh, by filtering out some uh, low-quality data columns, for example. So finally, uh, we suggest a couple of good model types, things which can be actually uh, used on your data set. Um, that is also based on what we call our wisdom of crowds uh, functionality, which really learns from how data scientists are actually modeling the data. And so we took those best practices and put this into this model selection step. And then there all the number crunching is happening and you will get some results. And this is where we spend probably most of the time today, um, like going through those results and making sure that we all understand um, what, what they really mean. But the most important thing, and this is really important because auto modeling got a little bit of a hype in the last couple of, well, months, maybe one or two years. And I personally, I have to admit, I was always thinking like, well, as a data scientist, this is not real data science. It's too restricting. So there was a lot of hype, but frankly, if you do it wrong and you just hope you can get some like big red button and you upload the data, you press the button and then you, you're done with this. What happens then is you're trying typically to optimize for some quality measurement like, let's say, accuracy or, or AOC, or it doesn't really matter. And if that's the only driving factor for your auto modeling, that is very dangerous because typically this will lead to you including some of the data columns you shouldn't include uh, because um, it, it might actually give away something to the model that's not available at the point in time of time uh, you, you do the predictions. Um, this is a good example. We will see actually one of those examples in, in one of the demonstrations later. So that is really dangerous. So I was, was a little bit like torn. Well, what are we going to do about this? So when we actually tackled the auto model problem, we said like, look, we have this powerful rapid miner platform. Let's build all those things in the models in an easy way. 
but let's not build a black box. I hate black boxes. And no matter who I talk to in the data science space, everybody says exactly that. Black boxes are the evil thing we need to avoid for good reasons, because if you don't understand what's going on, you can't trust your models, you can't put it into production, you can't really say how well it works in the future, because even if people claim, well, yeah, that model works well, and we did a proper cross-validation, you can't really know that. So black boxes are not acceptable in my world. So we want to have the auto modeling and all the great acceleration, but without the black box. So that was really what was driving us. And who did we do it for? So that's kind of actually the, the last uh, slide before we, we just jump into demos and, and see it. But I think there's two um, big groups of people uh, who can actually benefit from, from this new rapid minor auto model, the, the beginner data scientist and the advanced data scientist. For the beginner, it just makes life so much easier. So if you build your first machine learning models at all, it's so much easier really because you will get some guidance in a couple of minutes, you will get actually your first models, you will start to understand what's going on. And again, it's not a black box. So at the end, you can actually press a button and you will get the full rapid minor process which is, has been used to build this model for you. And that is really powerful because then as a beginner, you can actually look into this process and you can learn from this. <clears throat> and I think that is pretty awesome for the beginner data scientists. But for the advanced data scientists who might be able to actually build all those processes and models themselves, for them actually it like, like cuts down the time for this prototyping phase. And that's really where we spend most of our time in prototyping, trying out different model types, different data preprocessings. And while we're doing this, like, well, we spend easily weeks, sometimes months of time to actually get, build a couple of good model candidates. And that you can bring down now to a couple of minutes, which makes you more productive. So awesome. So I think it's really there's some good benefit for, for everybody. And that's why I personally am really, really excited about this. But that only works if you don't have black box. So having said all this, um, giving you the idea what we build and why we build it, um, I will now go through four or five, I don't know exactly, but we will see um, different use cases. And the first one is not really use case. Um, it is a data set many of you probably know. Um, this is about predicting the survival likelihood for all the passengers of the Titanic accident. Well, why would I like to start with this because the fun thing is, I mean, first of all, the data set is well known, known among data scientists. So it's something you're familiar with. Um, I think that's a good starting point for understanding uh, what's going on in behind the scenes here. But the other thing is this data set actually comes with all the challenges or almost all the challenges um, data scientists need to face when it comes to data. There's missing values. There are some columns which are highly correlated with the label, which is actually in this case a negative thing. There is um, some columns which are completely meaningless or ID-like columns. You need to deal with all of those, those problems. So we will actually do this and learn something about the auto model and the results first. And then from there, we move to some more, let's say, realistic use cases. So let's actually switch over to rapid minor. So here it is. Um, well, that's the usual rapid minor, uh, as, as you know it. And there's actually a couple of different ways how to get into the auto model mode. <clears throat> and I will focus on this one here first, or actually probably all the time, uh, which is this new view button here at the top. So if you're familiar with Rapid Miner, typically you will, would build processes here on this large white space, and then you can actually execute those processes and this will deliver some results. But here is the third option now, which is called Auto Model, and that's uh, where we get started. So let's actually um, follow those steps. And you see here at the top, at this progress bar, those steps are really very similar to what I just have been showing you on, on, the, on the slide. So we start with selecting some data set, then we will define the task, prepare the target a little bit, do some filtering, and then do some model selection, or not model selection in the optimization sense, but um, we'll get some recommendation for models we should use, and you can override them if you want. And then last but not least, um, we will um, uh, inspect the results. So, it always starts with, in, in Rapid Miner, what we call a repository. And if you want to learn more about what all those things are, you can have a look here in, on the right side in this information panel. But the repository is really the place where we store basically everything, data, processes, models. The data can, could come from a database, a local database, or some other database. It could come from some server repositories from the cloud. Um, in our first case here, I actually have this um, repository called Auto Model Demo here. 
And there's a couple of different uh, data sets, and here's the Titanic one. And if I select this, you see some basic information um, here on the right side. So it's a relatively small data set, 1,300 rows, 12 columns or attributes, as we call them. And here you see uh, some properties of the data. If it's not in a, re a repository yet, well, there's all the usual ways to get the data into the repository. You could import the data. You can even do it from here by clicking this link up here. Um, or in the design view, you can even build complete ETL processes um, to actually get the data into a repository. That's not the topic for today's webinar, but, but there's a lot of options there. All right, so we selected the data and press next. On the next screen, we see actually the data. And as I promised already before, there's all typical problems. So for example, here in this column, you see there's a couple of uh, missing values. Uh, there's missing values also for some other columns here. Um, we have our 12 columns here, and one column is of specific interest, which is the survival column here on, on the far right. This is the column we would like to predict based on the other columns, okay? So that makes it a prediction task. And I clicked on this column already, which actually selected it, and also selected here the predict uh, task. I could also do second segmentation or outlier detection. We will do this a little bit later. But if you actually do a prediction, then obviously you need to select the target column below. Um, and only then you can actually continue and press on next down here. So let's do that. So the next step is about preparing the target. And that depends on A, if there is a target. So for example, for clustering, there is none. So you would just skip this gap here. Or um, if it's, for example, a numerical column or a, a categorical column, in this case, we have two different classes, yes and no. Um, you could, for example, map those classes to new values. So if you like, you could call this here now, I don't know, uh, uh, false and true. And uh, that sometimes makes some sense to actually rebrand those things. Um, yes, and no, it's totally fine with me. But there's another thing um, for selecting the class of highest interest. So for, especially for binary uh, classification tasks like this one here, um, often it's, one class is more interesting. So here, for example, I would really care a little bit more about survival than about dying on this ship. So that's why this class of higher interest for me, and I would like to my models to focus on this class. Um, and in other cases, for example, for direct mailing, uh, the response class would be more interesting than the non-response class. Or for churn prediction, typically you're more interested in, in the churn case because you want to do something about them. So and there's actually some heuristics and smartness built in. So RapidMiner actually guesses uh, which class was probably of higher interest, and in this case, it correctly guessed that the yes class here is, is the one of higher interest. So anyway, so in this particular case, I don't actually need to do anything, so I can just go on with next. So sometimes for larger data sets, this calculation you just might have seen up here um, it might take a couple of, of seconds, maybe even a minute. And that's because we calculate a lot of what we call like quality measures in the background. And those quality measures actually are shown here on the right side of this table. So now every column of our data gets uh, one row here. Um, so we have the name column, the ticket number, the cabin, and so on. And those columns have different properties. And you see that those quality measures actually now are transformed into a traffic light. So obviously, if something is green, that's a good data column. You should keep it in, in your data set for modeling. Everything looks good. And that's true for all the columns here at the bottom. If something is red, obviously something is wrong. And if something is orange, well, at least you should actually, or yellow, you should actually have a look into this, okay? So like a traffic light, really. Pay some attention, but maybe it's still fine to, to drive over the traffic light and, light, and that's the same is true here. So let's start with the red. Things could become a red column because um, they, they are behaving like an ID. So you see here on the right side, the ID-ness of this column here is very high. That's also indicated by this huge blue bar here. It's not a 100% ID because apparently two passengers share the same name. That can happen. But it's practically an ID. So that's why we actually mark this column here as red because if something is behaving like an ID, it's really not useful at all for machine learning. It can actually be even somewhat dangerous for some machine learning uh, methods to actually include it um, and lead to some severe case of overfitting. So that's not good. So you should remove it. And you could do it by just clicking somewhere here and actually getting rid of it. Or you could just later on, you will see it actually just click on deselect red here, and then everything red is deselected, OK? Um, so let's just select them for now uh, again. So then the tick number, same story here. It's not exactly as ID-like like, um, like the name, but it's pretty high. So again, it's red. Kevin is interesting. It's red as well, but apparently not because of a high ID. 
cabin is red because almost 80% of all the values indicated by this red bar here are missing. So practically there's no information in this column. So again, it's a good idea to get rid of this. In general, a good practice is to just get rid of all the reds. Sometimes though, you want to have a second look. Um, that's why we don't deselect it for you. We give you the guidance and you can make the ultimate choice. But if you have hundreds of reds and you just want to build quickly a first model, it's typically a good best, best practice to just deselect all the red ones. So now the yellow ones are interesting. Lifeboat here. It has a lot of missings, uh, but not quite enough to make it a, uh, uh, like, a, like a red one. But it also is highly correlated with our label column survived. And that actually sometimes is a good thing. Sometimes that is, those columns are the most helpful ones for your predictive model. But in this case, I would actually suggest to remove it because of this high correlation. Why? Because the last I've post information, it is not available to you at the moment of time where you can actually do something with the prediction. So think about the Titanic accident. It's 1912, like you're on a boat somewhere in the, like, in, like 500 miles or whatever away from Newfoundland. There is not much you can do. I mean, you can't take out your cell phone and call a helicopter to the rescue. So at that moment, actually your fate is sealed. So the last moment you can actually do something is for example, when you are boarding the ship. And at that moment, you don't even know if you will make it on the lifeboat or not. So the lifeboat information should not be part of this data set, to be honest. Um, that's one way of seeing it. Um, or you should actually predict who makes it on the lifeboat in the first place. So this is exactly the reason why, like, purely automatic, magic wand-like, red button solution where you just upload the data, press a button, and hope for the best are not acceptable in my world because you want to get this information, this guidance to make an educated decision, but you still need to be in the driver's seat because an op op completely automated approach would basically just include the lifeboat because it will generate better models. And that would be the wrong thing to do because later on, when you put the model into production, it will actually get worse. So long story short, I, I think this thing is extremely useful. That's why I spent a little more time on this uh, for this one here. But in this particular case, deselect all the red ones, deselect the yellow ones, uh, but keep all the green ones. That is actually a good data set to work with. So the next step now, RapidMiner suggests a couple of good models for you. So they're general models like this one here, like correlations between the columns or importance of columns. They're not really models, but, but still give you some interesting insight into your data. And then the actual prediction models. And we pre-selected a couple of those for you, depending on the data types, the, the, the target you have, the data set size and all this kind of thing. So we actually make some suggestions based on this wisdom of crowd data we have, uh, what you should probably use. And there's everything from very simple models like night base and, and linear models. Of course, logistic regression is here as well. And then let's say deep learning and some tree-based models like decision tree or even gradient boosted trees, okay? So everything is in there. In this particular case, let's just do it all and let's run. So while it is running, the first thing we see is the data itself. So this is the prepared data. So after it went through the cleaning processes, um, we see the data here. And the number crunching is happening in the background, which is indicated here at the top. And while we do the number crunching, let's actually go to this overview tab. We can actually already inspect some of the results. So, so far, for example, we see that five out of the six models already have been calculated. And the deep learning model so far has delivered the best accuracy of almost 81%. But it also was running for some time. I mean, it's like five, five six, six seconds actually of runtime. So let's see how the gradient boosted trees are going to, to perform. But definitely one thing is for sure already, they will take much more time. So again, while it's running, let's actually have a look into some other uh, results. So let's skip the rock comparison for now, but um, let's for example, look into the models themselves. So here's a nice base model that already has been calculated and you can inspect those models now. You can actually have a look how well, how much age influences those two classes, or let's say the passenger class. So you can definitely see that first class passengers definitely had a higher uh, chance of survival than let's say third class passengers here on the right, okay? So there's, um, there's those models here, nice. Let's see if this actually finished. Nope, it's still running well, while it's still running. Let's actually have another look into what we call the simulator. And this is another super exciting thing, which is, uh, not, let's say, directly connected to the to the auto model, but it's one of the new features of RapidMiner 8.1 as well. Um, and it's really, again, in the spirit of no black boxes, it actually helps you to understand those very complex machine learning models in a better better way. So think 
what is uh, deep learning neural network? So for example, here, the model is kind of like, well, you can't really read it and understand something. I mean, for a decision tree, it's kind of easy. Uh, you can actually look into the tree and you will understand something. Nice base, again, you can understand a little bit. But for deep learning, gradient boosted trees, those models are more complex. You can't really understand them. But the simulator actually changes that. So with the simulator, you can actually inspect those models and play around with the inputs and see how the model behaves. So for example, here on the left side, we have all the different inputs of the models. Uh, let's say the age uh, we see here, um, and it's initial, initialized with the average age of all the passengers. Uh, the number of parents or children on board, the passenger class, and, and, and the gender, for example, here at the bottom. So and on the right side, you can actually see for those settings here how the model would react. And this model for a person with those properties here would actually predict that this is not a survival case. So this person, unfortunately, will die during the accident. And the likelihood for that is 91%. And the biggest supporter for this prediction is the gender. So, which you can see here at the bottom. So you can basically say like, okay, well, I, I'm a male person and so that's not helpful. So it's 1912, I know it's, um, it's different times, not easy to change your gender that easily uh, back then, um, but let's just assume you would. And that one change alone would actually bring you already into the yes camp and you have a much, not much higher, well, you have a much higher likelihood of survival, but it's almost a 50-50 case, but at least, it's more likely to survive already with a 55% probability. And again, the gender is the highest supporter now for this positive outcome. Um, another supporter is the passenger fare, but one like, kind of like contradictor, I'm not even sure if that's an English word, but um, is for example, the passenger class. So the passenger class is not helpful, so it's the third class. So, well, let's change the class then maybe to the first class. If I do that, again, the first class is now supporting the yes case and it's actually going up up to 84%. And even if you play around, for example, with like numerical values, and I hope you can see this in the screencast, so while I'm changing them, you see that on the left side how the new value behaves compared to all the values I know. And you can actually, by bringing it a little bit up here, you can actually bring it up to 100% uh, likelihood of survival if you're a woman in first class and pay 130 bucks, okay? So that's one way how to, to actually use the simulator. You can actually play around, you see what actually supporting and contradicting certain decisions that helps you to understand what's going on. You can try out different options for your, for your models and like you, you know the outcome for so you can see if the model behaves like you would expect it. But if you're interested in to get to the best business outcome, which clearly in this case is um, it's survival, then there's this nice little optimize button here. And you can now actually even say something like, well, you know what, I would just like to survive. Let's optimize for that. Let's maximize the confidence for, for survival. I can just keep those settings here. Although, you know what? I'm actually, let's say, I'm um, <clears throat> roughly 40 years old, um, and I'm also, uh, I'm actually not changing my gender. I will stay a man uh, for now. So let's actually um, set those two things as a constraint because those are two things I can't really change. But hey, everything else, go for it. Um, and let's just optimize this here and you see it takes a couple of seconds but after it's done and when I press the finish button now now of course uh, my my uh, my age and the gender here are set uh, but in this particular case I should actually buy a first class ticket and pay even a little bit more 141 bucks and travel with like one parent or children on board and if I do that I actually also get a hundred percent likelihood for survival so if I want to get the best outcome for me here you go that's how you connect those models with like true business outcome and the best action. All right, uh, let's go back to the overview. We see, okay, the grain boosted trees are done. And as you can see, it took really quite some time. So more like roughly two and a half minutes. Um, so it takes much more time. It's 0.8% better and to be really honest. In this case, I, I would go with a deep learning model probably because in this case, I think it's just, yeah, so much better. Um, or it's not that better, but it's so much faster and almost as good, and if I want to actually put it into production or do further optimization, that's actually the, uh, the model I would probably pick. And then last but not least, uh, you also see the, the general weight, so what was important across all those models, so the gender in general is important, the passenger class, we got this already from the optimizer and the simulator before, the passenger fare, those are really the important uh, factors here. And of course, you can also see the correlations, so what is correlated with what, um, 
obviously the passenger class, for example, and uh, well, the, not the passenger class and the age are somewhat correlated. So if you're older, you're more likely to buy a bigger class. Um, but also, for example, the first class and the passenger fare are also correlated, um, and that makes sense as well, I guess. Okay, so anyway, um, so this is the first run through, uh, and that was probably the longest one for the for the auto model. And I want to give you the basic ideas what this whole thing is about and how it's working. So you load the data, you make a couple of simple decisions, you get some guidance and what data to include and what not to include. And then you get a couple of recommendations for models, you run them, you will find out what the best model is in your case. And then um, it's, um, well, it's, it's a good first result, but there's a little bit more and we go through the other use cases and you will see what else is there. So next use case is about prediction of heart diseases. So in fact, I was a bit shocked when I was um, looking recently into what is the number one cause for death um, in, in North America. And it turned out that um, I, thought, I think it's called uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, this is actually the number one reason for people dying. I mean, even more than cancer. I mean, even cancer, which is the number two reason, is um, not causing as much uh, the death and, and suffering than, than cardiovascular diseases. So that is really an important topic. In fact, um, alone in the United States, almost 30 million people are diagnosed with heart disease. Um, that's, uh, that, that's, I think, roughly 10, 12% of, of the whole population. That's a lot. Um, so long story short, in, this is an important topic. And I, I have no medical background whatsoever, so don't ask me now about the signs we will find. But that's exactly the exciting thing. So let's actually run this through the auto model and see what we can learn. All right, so back here, uh, let's just go back and select a different um, data set. Here we go, the heart disease data set. Uh, you see there's a couple of different attributes here, and the age is another one time here, the gender as well, but then a couple of like medical things. Let's just go to next. So since this data set was already stored in the repository with information, this is a label, the auto model already picks this one up and says like, okay, let's predict this column here. And it can, of course, change that if you change your mind, but uh, we want to predict if somebody is going to suffer from a heart disease or not. And here's all this kind of different information and I have really no clue what this all means. Like, well, probably the only thing I do understand is resting blood pressure, uh, but that's kind of it. All right, so again, I'm not a, not a medical doctor, so I don't know, but we can just go through the, um, through the process here. So here again, we don't need to make any changes. The good news is actually, if we look into the quality measurements here, all the columns are ready to go, so no changes here. It looks like we can actually run again with all the different models here, so well then, let's do it. And um, actually, let's go, let's go into the results. So the computation is happening. You can see it's already a little bit further along, so let's have a look into the overview. And we get already pretty good accuracies, um, but let's, this time, let's not focus on the accuracy because it could look into a couple of papers which are um, like scientific papers which are using those the data set here and most people actually use something else like for example the AUC so in here left to the of the table you can actually change what is the uh, performance measurement you're interested in so the AUC is also the area under the curve and you will see the curve in a second let's actually optimize for this and you see that the general linearized model actually has an area under the curve value of 0.9 but it's already pretty high actually plus it was kind of fast but like 300 milliseconds so that looks good so that's a good result here that is this model here the second one we calculated um so far by the way it's also i think it is also the most accurate one so that looks good so let's um let's keep this in mind let's also have a look into this roc comparison those are those rock curves um and i'm not expecting what exactly it means, but, but the important thing is visually, what you want to achieve with your models is to, you want to go as far to the top left corner as you can. So this decision tree here, which is the green line, really is not performing very well. Forget about them. Um, so just the last model just came in. And as you can see, the uh, greenish one here, the GLM is pretty good. Um, uh, this is one, this is this yellow one up here, but the blue one here, Knife is actually doing quite well as well. So have a look again. AOC, yeah, GLM, knife base. This is basically the area under those rock curves. Um, they are pretty good. I mean, it's a matter of taste almost like, I mean, knife base is even faster, which is good. But then on the other hand, I mean, the, uh, the GLM looks a little bit better. So probably I would go with the, with the generalized linear model 
because it's really good in the, in the on the AUC front, but also uh, for the accuracy. And you can go for different things, for example, precision and other things. And the precision, by the way, is using this class of interest. So this is the precision which has been calculated for the class. Yes, there is a heart disease. And you can actually see this also if you go here into the detailed performance. So for every model, you have those different results. So if I go for the precision here, you see the positive class here is yes. That is the class we selected earlier on as the class of higher interest. All right, so um, let's have a look uh, quickly into two more things. So decision tree model here, again, you can visualize this. So here, for example, the no cases, there's a nice path going here. The yes cases seem to be a little more difficult, but this one here pops out. There's one path which uh, seems to be covering a little more. Yes cases, the same as here. You can see the zoom width of the bar. So here's two paths for like, for for yes cases, you can actually inspect it here. You're not doing the disk simulator again, uh, but maybe another thing to point out, we did some automatic optimization of parameters. So for example, here we figured that uh, um, the maximum depth of the, of the decision tree should be 50, and that actually delivered the best models here. You can also see how well the other uh, parameters perform. But then on the other hand, the decision tree really haven't been that great after all. But you get the same results, for example, also for gradient boosted trees. We get all the models here. In this case, obviously, those models are a little bit smaller, so the maximal depth of only two uh, was actually performing best. But then, on the other hand, you calculated 60 of those trees, and that delivered the best performing model. But all those three models actually haven't been as good as the GLM. So after we figured that one out, what can you do now as the next step? And this is probably the one thing which excites me most about auto model because because I can now press this little button here, open process, I can do this for all those different results. You just select some results you're interested in, like the GLM model here. I can then press open process, and if I do that, I will get, let me actually make this a little bit bigger here, I will get the full process which has been created, um, or which has loaded the data set, which did all the data pre-processing, created the model, did the parameter optimization if necessary, in this case there was none, but, um, and created all those results. So starting with actually um, the data loading, so all the parameters are pre-selected. We do the right pre-processing here. So there's a lot of things like, like um, discretizing a label if you should, or removing some of the columns. So this is all predefined, handling missing values, everything you need to do to actually make this model work, do the correct validation, everything else. And if I run this process now, in Rapid Miner, I get all the results we have seen before, like the GLM, the performance values, so everything we have seen before, um, we get here again. Um, and you can use this as a starting point. You can learn from it. As I said, for beginners, that's a great way to learn how to build great models. But for a more experienced person, you can also make further optimization, or at the, for the last use case, we will do this. We will actually turn this um, into a scoring process, which then can be put into production. But before we get there, so first of all, no black boxes. You can always understand what exactly is going on there. And I think that is the important part here. All right, so before we do the real use case, uh, one last fun one. Um, I'm actually not that much of a wine expert, uh, to be honest, uh, coming from Germany. Uh, like, I mean, I know there's a lot of great wines coming from Germany, but it's more like a beer drinking country, I guess. Um, anyway. So um, I, at one point, uh, got hands on this uh, wine data set, and I find it really, really exciting from a data science perspective. And maybe one day I will just try all those different wines as well from a wine drinker perspective, but maybe later. So for now, all we know is that we have a, a data set with a lot of like, um, well, sensor data is probably not the right word, but like people did like a chemical analysis for all the different wines and then some experts certainly not me assigned a um, um, quality score between one and six to all those different wines and now obviously the first question could be can we actually predict what those experts would think about a wine based on the result of this chemical analysis all right so let's go back to the order model um, and let's start with this data set so here I have this in two flavors, one a classification task, but I would also like to show you a regression problem. So here, I take now this uh, numerical um, quality measurement. Here is this column, and I would like to predict this. So, so far we have been seeing classification tasks, and actually only binary classification tasks, but it works also for more than two classes. 
Here now, we predict a number, which obviously is a regression problem. So let's see what happens. Um, first thing we see is a small difference. We see a histogram. Since we only have six different discrete numbers, you could almost argue this is a borderline classification task itself, and that wouldn't be wrong. Um, and let's save this for a little bit later, but you can also turn this now into a classification task. But let's do this a little bit later. So I can actually go on here. Again, the data set already has been prepared by somebody else, so it's all good. We can actually keep all those measurements. And then for the model type, they changed a little bit. So there's obviously no logistic regression because despite the name, it doesn't work for anything but binary classification tasks. Um, but uh, there's a couple of the other models we have seen before as well. Uh, there's no knife base, and of course we have the GLM and, and others. Okay, so let's run this. Oh, um, yeah, okay, let's let's just run it. It might run actually a little bit longer than I wanted because the auto optimize for this data set will actually take some time. Um, anyway, so first of all, we get the data again, um, and we get some overview here. And you see already like random forest, gradient boosted trees, they will actually run like for a minute or two, but whatever, I, I am explaining the rest to you anyway. So you see the root mean squared error, which is a very common regression measurement, but um, it's often hard to interpret so I like kind of things like relative errors a little bit more because that tells me like oh sure we are like on average 12 percent off with our predictions which seems to be pretty good already so so far uh, the GLM again is doing a pretty good job on, on this data set again so I can have a look into the details here and even more important if I look into the simulator now uh, the simulator now is not giving us classes, obviously, but it gives us uh, numerical predictions. So this here, this, this wine, which actually uses all the average values as input, also gets an average rating. That shouldn't be probably super surprising. Um, so if you do an average wine, you get an average rating. I mean, that kind of makes sense. So and you can play around. So for example, sulfates and, and alcohol, um, they play some important roles. So let's maybe change, where's the alcohol here at the top? If you play around here, you see how the quality changes. If I bring the alcohol down, actually, it's inverse. I mean, if you already have a bad wine and then you reduce the alcohol, it's probably not doing it any better. Again, I have no clue. Um, but if you bring the alcohol up, like, oh, look at that. Actually, we can get to a pretty good wine again. Um, and uh, now, actually, the sulfate became even more important for this setting. Where do we have them here, for example? I can play around. But it's really hard to get to like a good wine. So maybe again, we try just to optimize it. Let's maximize the wine quality. Uh, and let's run this optimizer here. If I do this, oh yeah, that looks already a little bit harder than the problems before. I click on finish. And if I would be a wine producer now, that would be what I would do. I would use those wine settings. I would try to produce a wine with those parameters, with those properties. And if you do that, you get actually a 5.6 rating, which is already really, really high. So um, now let's get away a little bit from wine because who cares about wines really? I mean, there's only so few people in the world. But think about like predictive, not predictive maintenance, but you're let's say in manufacturing and you're producing products. Um, there's something which is called yield optimization. All those use cases where you actually want to optimize the quality of your products or you want to know what the quality of the product you're currently producing is. So here you can actually now predict it. And then for example, try to change the process settings so that the quality is becoming better at the end for the final product. Or sometimes the best outcome might be, well, there's no way to actually make the product any better, but it won't survive our quality standards. So let's not, not put additional um, manufacturing steps into this because frankly, it, it won't be good enough. I can't sell it. So um, yield optimization really is an important use case. Um, and so you can, you can actually do this. So, so as we see again, like, okay, good, grain boosted trees are doing actually a better job, 48 seconds though, so maybe you go with them or you just stay with the super fast GLM, um, roughly the same performance up to you. But you see it works for um, uh, regression as well. So super quickly, I kept the numbers, but you can also turn this into classification. Um, so I just went back here and say, for example, I would like to actually have, let's say, three classes and all classes would be the same size. So now the middle class here is a little bigger. Now I turn this into a three class classification problem. And if I do this and just not run those two here, that takes too long, actually take this one here as well. And I run this one here again. I now turn this whole thing into a classification problem. All three classes are like equally distributed. So the, the default accuracy should be 33%. You see again, well, that looks actually quite good. And the grain boosted trees here with the 70% accuracy actually um, work quite well. Uh, again, 
Um, so yeah, they probably would be a good model for this case. All right, so last thing on the wine front. That is one thing you can do. You can actually use this quality measurement for predicting things. But another thing I thought would be interesting, what about segmenting our wines? Like we do customer segmentation, but why not doing wine segmentation? Apparently, people are really going crazy on this kind of things. And again, I have no real clue. But um, well, maybe, maybe we should do that. So let's uh, turn this into a clustering task. Let's go back again, uh, even to here. And now I just select clustering here at the top. Um, now, I don't need to prepare the targets, but I should do one thing. I should take out the quality column because it doesn't really make sense for the cluster. You, you mean you could argue, keep it in. It doesn't really matter that much, but I would like to take it out. So I get different models here. Obviously, K means clustering. You can define the number of K. Let's just go with K equals three here, or X or cross means, which actually um, try to determine the right number of clusters for you. So let's just run this whole thing, get the data again, and you also will see some new cluster visualizations which are coming with Rapid Minor 8.1 as well. So here's our three clusters. One cluster is really tiny. That's not really a real cluster. That looks like more like an outlier cluster, to be honest, um, with only 40 uh, different wines. And keep in mind, those are all red wines, by the way. And then we have two larger clusters, almost 1,000 wines and 600 wines. And you can see what is typical for those different clusters here. It's even easier to see it on this heat map here. So for this cluster here, for some cluster two, uh, we can see that actually the acidity and is, is higher, while for class uh, one is actually lower, but uh, some sulfides are a little bit higher and, and some volatile acidity, whatever that means now, is a little bit higher as well. So you see what actually makes the difference between the different clusters. Same is true for cross means. Here, cross means identifies four clusters in total, again, with one of those outlier clusters. Um, if I look into the heat map again, I get a couple of more columns here, which are the differentiators for the clusters, but, but it's easy to interpret here what those different things actually mean. So here for cluster two, oh, it's the outlier cluster. That's not super interesting. But, but here, let's say, again, the sulfur dioxide, that's probably a totally wrong pronunciation, but who cares? Um, that's uh, like much larger for this cluster here. So another thing I like is this scatter plot, actually. So here you can click on the different clusters. Let's start with cluster zero. And you see now the two most discriminating factors for this clustering, which is in this case the citrate acid and the total sulfur dioxide. So this is actually what helps us to differentiate the blue cluster, which is here at the bottom left, the best. And that's now a little bit interesting. So it's low acids, low sulfides. And by the way, um, the sulfides, they are typically added to actually um, have more preservation for the wine. Um, that often is done for wines or, which have low, low tenants. Um, so if you need to add a lot of sulfides, you don't need to add that much sulfides if the wine has more tenants on its own because it has its own preservation or, uh, capability. So low acids, low sulfides, which means higher tenants, low acids, higher tenants, those typical wines are like Cabernet Sauvignon, especially from warmer climates. Again, I have not really any clue, but, but those are the wines which are here in the top, uh, bottom left corner here. If I uh, go in cluster one, this green cluster here, which is here to the top right, they have higher levels of sulfur um, and all kinds of sulfur. So that means they have lower tenants. So those are like Pinot Noir, Ganache, maybe some Merlot, and, and this kind of wine. So they are up here. Cluster two are just outliers, so you cast. Cluster three here is again to the top right, this red cluster here. They have high acidity, uh, high, um, wines with high, high acidity, like some Syrahs or Pinot Noirs, especially for cooler climates. Those are the wines which are in this cluster. So you can really find those clusters and actually it's easy to interpret them as well. All right, so the last thing uh, for this webinar is now to show you how to embed this whole automodel thing in a more realistic scenario. Um, so, and what I'm doing, what do I, I, I mean this more realistic here that typically the data is not coming in one nice table already. So you need to do a little bit of ETL before and we can use RepMiner Studio for that. Uh, let's not go crazy today because, again, that's not the main focus, but I would like to give you the idea how to do it. Then you do the auto model, and then we use this model for predictions. So use case here is churn prediction. Um, so can we predict the likelihood for customer churn for each of our clients? Um, so let's go back into this and actually have a look into our data first. So let's actually start with a brand new process here. So if I go into my churn for 
over here, you see that I actually have like a couple of different data sets. So the first data set here is what I call, actually let's close all those results so we're not getting confused. Okay, so the first one here is this churn data. If I do a double click on this data set, you see basically we have a customer ID and information if they churned or not. And for most of our customers, actually further down here, we don't have this information um, because, well, we don't know yet. So um, that's exactly what we would like to predict. So then we have some customer data. This, this is just basically like base information, like what kind of contract do they have, where do they live in what state, what's their phone number and stuff like that. Okay, so some basic information. And then we have transactions data. So transactions data here means like, hey, how many messages did they send? So this is a telco data set. How many uh, minutes did they talk during the day, during the evening, during the night, et cetera. So there's a couple of like transactional information as well. So those three data sets, they all have an ID, so we need to bring them together. And in the interest of time, I'm not building this process now, but I will just load one, which is this one here. I basically retrieve those different data sets and I just use our churn operators. I mean, like, honestly, it's that, that simple as that. Since we all have IDs, in this case, there's not much more to do. You take the first two, you join them, you, you join this result with the, with the third data set, and then you store this whole thing uh, under the name results complete data, which is this one here. And let's just quickly run this whole process. And this is the total result here. This is my data set now, and everything is joined together. Of course, sometimes you would need to do some aggregation, some pivots, and all the other stuff. And there's like literally hundreds of operators in the Rapid Miner toolbox for you to, for doing all the data blending and data cleansing, like to your heart's content. Again, not the topic for today, but typically, or in many cases, you need to do a little bit before. Uh, or you have somebody else do it for you if you don't know how. Um, but then at the end, the result is stored in this repository. And you can basically, there's another way, you can right click here on this results and click on auto model, which brings up the auto model screen with this data set pre-selected. So here it is, um, uh, the, the data set we just generated and we can basically move on. So here we have our data, and this is our churn column, so we'd like to predict it. So I'm going a little bit faster through this one now because you saw it a couple of times. Again, rep minor guessed correctly, yes, it's the right class here. We have a bit of data of quality issues here. Obviously, there's the ID column, which has a 100% ID score. That one has to go. But international char uh, charge has so many missings, probably a good idea to get rid of this one as well. And the phone number is kind of like an ID as well. So let's get rid of those three. And those two here, they have such a low correlation with the, with the label. It doesn't really hurt to keep them in, but why not? It's just to get rid of them. And again, I, I turn off the uh, automatic optimization here um, because uh, it, it would run for, I would say, probably a little bit larger data set, I don't know, like 20,000 rows or so. It would probably run for like 10 minutes and we don't have the time today. But um, I just turn it off. You could turn it on if you, if you want to try it yourself. It, it will just take a little bit longer um, and let's run this whole thing so we see we got the data here that's the first thing um, we get the different models here so the first model night base here is an 85 86 uh, percent accuracy so what's interesting about this this data set in this case here there's actually a lot of people who have been like competing on this data set often like the AUC is uh, reported and often you get like AUC values of like roughly like 0.85 uh, to be among the best models you can, you can build on this data set. So let's see how, how well we can do here. Um, deep learning will take a little bit, but let's see how well it will perform. Again, everything else is like, oh, look at that, 0.86. So again, typically the best models are around 0.85. So yeah, it took 20 seconds, but it's also re really doing a good job. So. If you go into the RC comparison, you can see actually it really stands out here. And even this automatic optimization, um, like the gradient boosted trees or random forest wouldn't do any better. So deep learning really kills it on this data set, so fine. Let's, um, let's probably go with this. So what you can do next now is if you think deep learning is the winner, um, again, you can select the model or any, any other result from here. You can select the model and open the process, which brings up the whole process creating the deep learning model. And all we need to do now to put this into production, and I'm not showing you all the details, but I give you the, the general spirit, is to add a couple of store operators. And I basically put the store operator here, where I basically store the model, which is delivered here. And I do another one, which stores the training data here. 
So I did it already before. So if I look into deployment churn, I just, so here is the process which has been generated. So I did this yesterday. And I added those two store operators. Then you run this process again. Then you get the model and the training data. Okay? After I did this, there's no multiple ways how you can actually put this into production. But one way I personally like is to um, run this little process here, which takes the training data and transforms this training data into a single row, which uses the average value for all the, or the mode value for all the columns. All right? And that one now can be fed into a third process, which is even simpler. And this third, third process uses what we call those matrices. See, and I know that's a little bit fast, but I just want to give you the general idea. Those macros here, you can actually change when you want to put this model into production. So, for example, the day minutes and the international plan from the auto model, now we know this is important. So, let's actually use those here as, as parameters for our process. And I can take the single line data set. I can change those values using those macros here. I can take the model which has been created by the auto model. I apply the model here and create a prediction. So now I get predictions for those changed data sets. And I can then store this whole process on the server of RapidMiner. And again, I'm not showing you to you. I mean, there's educational videos for that one. I'm not showing you to the, all the details. But if I would go on the server here, all you do really, literally, it is, it is you take this process we just built and you store it on the server. Oh, sorry, I'm not connected. doesn't matter. You store it on the server um, under some name here. And then you turn this into a web service. And this web service then can be used. I mean, here's an URL for this whole thing then. I can, for example, say like, oh, yeah, I don't have a plan. I am talking 180 minutes or whatever. I can test this whole thing. And in this case, in this case, I deliver XML back. This is not a churn case. OK, so that's good to know. But let's now say I have an international plan. And I only talk 60 minutes. I get a complete different prediction. In this case, yeah, it's going to be a yes case, um, a churn case, so probably I should do something about this. And that can be integrated with Salesforce easily, with whatever system you want to integrate with, uh, BI-like uh, systems, data visualization like Tableau or Click. Uh, it, this can be literally integrated into whatever you want to integrate it with. All right, so that gives an idea. So often you start with a bit of ETL, then you do the auto modeling in the middle, then you can further optimize if you want to, um, and then you put in the model into production on server and can actually use it. So before I wrap and open up for a couple of minutes of questions, two more minutes on like uh, why am I personally so excited? So first of all, there are just no magic ones in machine learning. They are not. Um, we know this, what we call the no free lunch theory, and there is not a single machine learning model that is always the best. And the same is actually true for everything we do around machine learning, including data preparation. There is no magic wand. So sometimes the best we can do is to guide you, to make your life simpler, and to automate all the number crunching and the hard parts. But I still think you should be in the driver's seat and you should fully understand what is going on so you can trust the model and you can make it better. And, or you can even make it right, because a magic wand would often just make it in the wrong way. In general, this whole idea of no black boxes is incredibly important. Um, so don't trust black boxes. I've seen people putting models into production built with a black box approach, and they have been horribly failing later in production. It's really dangerous, so don't do it. Don't accept black boxes at all. I think that's, that's a mistake. Last thing I would like to point out, a lot of the things you saw in the auto model are now also available as operators. So if you're a RapidMiner user, you can basically use operators like model simulator, explain predictions, prescriptive analytics, which is this optimizer in, in, in this uh, simulator. Um, there's another operator for those nice uh, cluster visualizations. So there's a lot of new operators you can actually use in your processes as well. Well, and that's kind of it. Uh, I'm running out of time, and I would like to have a little bit of time for a couple of questions at the end. Um, I think you know it by now. Um, so our mission truly is real data science, fast and simple. Um, and that's true for everything we do, for the process designer, for our server product, but it's also true for the new auto model. It's the real thing. It's just as fast and simple as it can get. So that is really important for us, that we're not compromising on, on results, completeness, correctness at all. It stays the real deal, because otherwise there is no way that you could be successful in your data science approach. And that's really what um, this is all about. I want you guys to be as successful as possible with um, your favorite data science 
platform <laughs> a little bit biased maybe all right um i'm not going through the key takeaways really for a long time um it, it's it's it is the auto model is a true accelerator uh with all the black boxes we cover really everything like uh, the data prep for modeling. There might still be the need for some data prep for some ETL type of things. But for modeling, the model selection, parent optimization, card validation, um, but it can combine for the rest of the platform for doing whatever else you need to do. Um, and there's a couple of new operators, especially around prescriptive analytics, uh, which is important to know as well. And then the very, very last thing, it's available for everybody in March. Uh, so like in, in March, we start our March Madness Month. So whoever actually downloads RapidMiner for the first time or whoever uh, even is already a RapidMiner user, everybody will get 30 days of auto model for free and go crazy with it. Um, I think it's, you will like it. It's, it's really an exciting new addition to the platform. And with that, let's open it up for questions. Great, so thanks, Ingo. As a reminder uh, to those on the line, we will be sending a recording of today's presentation within the next few business days, um, so feel free to share that with colleagues uh, and if you weren't able to attend the full presentation today. So like Ingo said, now it's time to get your audience questions. Uh, so I'll start out with the first question I see here. Uh, the first question is, is there a restriction on the size of the data set that's used? Um, no, not really. So you can actually throw as much data as you want um, at it, but uh, in most of those processes, and you will see it when you open up this black box and, and actually look into the details, there might be some sample operators for, um, for ensuring that this thing actually will get to an end. So for example, running an auto-optimized gradient booster trees on 10 million data rows will take weeks maybe. And nobody wants to wait for so long, so we embedded, embedded some sampling um, so it, to guarantee that yeah, you will get some good results in a reasonable amount of time. So typically, if you need to wait more than a couple of hours, um, that's borderline suspicious. So it should actually deliver some results, let's say, at least within 12 hours to you. Great, thanks. Uh, another question here, in the model recommendation step, can the user select specific models to test uh, in the list to run an auto model? Yeah, good question, actually. I, um, I've never deselected something, but um, and that is really what uh, what happens here. So you can you can actually say like I, I don't want that, um, and and select whatever you want to to do. Um, yeah, that is something you can do. Um, but you can't add anything outside of those which are provided to you. And there is a bit of a guiding function here. We, we don't want to, people to go crazy and throw models on their data, which are just not compatible. That might be something for some expert users we might want to add later. But at this moment, it's kind of like a pre-selected set based on the data properties, and you can select or deselect them. And if the data set is really large, they will actually be automatically deselected. But you can override this if you have more time to spare. spend. Uh, great. So another question is, this person's asking, um, is it going to tell me how much time it's going to take before um, auto model run? Um, yeah, kind of. And so that is really, this is such a, like, although we're in the prediction business, this is so hard to really predict exactly how long the modeling will run. It, it depends on so many things. Um, and and um, we don't know exactly how long it runs, but when we do some heuristics in the background and whenever um, you actually try to use a model on a data set and we think it will actually run for longer than roughly 12 hours, we at least give you a warning, so you will get some huge red warning and it will be deselected automatically. So um, you can still override this, but then be prepared that this might run actually for quite some time. Great, thanks. Uh, another question here, this one probably for everyone, are there tutorial videos available on auto model? Is there any documentation or anything? Oh yeah, oh, oh good, yeah, excellent question really. Um, yes, there are. So if you go into our learning part of our website, um, there is two, I think, great videos on uh, from our education team. Um, showing you exactly how to use it. Like in, in take much more time than I did today. I want to give you the, the overview, but there's really like a step step by step approach and you can just follow along on some of the data sets. So yeah, they are they are available to nice videos. And then there's also some documentation page and don't forget there's a lot of information here on the right side. So just start it and read through this so that might be helpful as well. Great. Uh, looks like this might be the last question due to time, but this person is asking, once you have the results and select the best model, what are the next steps to test the prediction on a new data set? Yeah, I, I kind of showed it to you um, super quickly, so this question might have been coming in before I actually showed it, but um, 
so, so first of all, um, we at Reminder take a lot of pride in doing model validation the right way. So, so like, trust us, when we say 86% accuracy, it's going to be 86% down the road. But of course, it's always the right approach to actually um, use like an, another independent test set to see how it's or validation set to see how it works. So um, yes, so the process I've shown here is, is like a simple way of how you can do this. So you can basically take the process which has been generated by Automodel, then you store the model, then you can basically, for example, feed the new data set through all the same uh, pre-processing steps, and then you just at the end add another apply model. So I was kind of like doing this in two separate processes, but, but that is relatively simple. Of course, you would need to learn a little bit of Rapid Miner Studio for that, but trust me, it's worth doing it anyway. So um, it's, it's not the hardest thing in the, it's like playing with Lego or something, like, like those little building blocks and, and playing around. So um, should be fine. Great. Um, so it looks like we are a few minutes over. So um, there are a ton of questions coming in. So apologies if we weren't able to address your question here on the line. We will follow up with you via email within the next few business days with an answer to your question. Um, so thanks again to Ingo and thanks again everyone for joining us for today's presentation and we hope you have a great day. Bye.